What is hell? This is what we will try to determine and prove in this study. What is hell is a question which has long been debated and discussed by scholars, students, and the faithful of Judaism and Christianity since God gave us his word. Growing up in church from a young age I was taught that hell was a place you did not want to go. A place of horrible agony, torment, blood, fire, brimstone, merciless torture, and insane never-ending pain. And I feared that picture of hell. It wasn't until later as I began to mature that I had a hunger to study from our Father's Word. And as I studied the Bible from the original languages of Hebrew, Greek, Chaldean, and Aramaic, I began to see that many of the things I had been taught about God and about Christianity were not exactly accurate to say the least, or were pale misinterpretations due to bad translation and or traditional or doctrinal teachings, rather than from what was actually written. The problem with doctrinal teachings is that you are taught to believe things without looking for yourself. You are seldom taught to go into the original languages and search out the scriptures and translate for yourself. You are taught to believe or accept things because of what a body of people, a denomination, or church body or group have decided is correct and true, rather than what scripture properly translated actually says. Remember, the famine for the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. Amos chapter 8. Now bad translation is a major cause of strife and division because oftentimes people rather than actually translating the Bible take it in an English only understanding or worse yet listen to whatever they are told and blindly believe whatever they hear from those they believe to be learned in the Word of God but who may not actually be qualified to handle the languages or effectively know what has been translated correctly or not. And some just transliterate. Now to transliterate means to take a word or phrase from an ancient language, even an ancient language like Hebrew or Greek, and translate it by finding the nearest kin to it in the language you wish to translate it to. But sometimes a word from an ancient language like Greek or Hebrew carries tremendous meaning and cannot so easily be translated. Now this can be for several reasons. It can be because it takes a lot of English words to translate the one word, or it can be that uh, the people who translated it did not know the speech patterns, the sayings, the colloquialisms, or the structure of the language they were translating from. In other words, the original thought and meaning was not conveyed properly. The thought did not carry through. And when you try to cram 9,000 plus words of Hebrew and 9,000 plus words of Greek into the 43 to 4,400 words of English we speak daily, you will have disconnect. Now there are more words than that in English, but many of them we do not use. And we certainly do not use them in daily regular speech or commonality. And if you try to cram all of those words from those two ancient languages into our English, you are going to have loss of translation and thusly incomplete conveyance of the message and a pale version of the original which can be at some points 180 degrees off from the true intent of the message. Another difficulty with transliteration is that some things are translated which are meant to be taken as an example or taken spiritually or as a type and rather it's translated as a literal. In doing so you can be mistaken and can even mislead, even if unintentionally. Now this has caused many of the troubles in Christianity. It has caused division, contradiction, and controversy. It causes people who are supposed to be one in the body of Christ, in other words the church, to separate into groups and factions. In fact the word denomination means to split from or to be apart from. And these splits usually occur over subtle little or trivial little arguments or different points of view which are 
mostly brought about due to ignorance of the original or true message. Again, the body of Christ is supposed to be one. Now with that said, let's go and find out what God's Word says about hell. And before we begin, let's ask our Father to bless us with knowledge and understanding as we search for the truth in His Word. Father in Heaven, we ask You to open our eyes and ears. We ask You to show us the truth from Your Word. We ask for You to make it plain to us so that we can see that hidden message that has been lost. We ask that You enlighten us and that You show us the true meaning of Your Word as You conveyed it to us. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, there are four words in the Bible which are translated into English as hell. But how can we know this? Well, first of all, you must obtain some tools to help you check it out. And such a tool is the Strong's Concordance which is an exhaustive concordance or dictionary of the Bible. This is a book which allows you to go and find out every Hebrew, Greek, or Chaldee, or Aramaic word used in the Bible or translated in the Bible. They are numbered. Another tool would be the Green Center Linear, which is a uh, set of the original texts. Now in Hebrew, the word for hell is soul, which in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, Hebrew partition is word number H7585, S-E-O-L, from 7592, pronounced Sheol, which is Hades, or the world of the dead, as if a subterranean retreat, including its accessories and inmates. The words it is most oftenly translated into are grave, or hell, or pit. Now when you read that definition, don't let the word inmates throw you. It simply means those who are awaiting judgment, or those who suffer the second death, which is their punishment. And we will expound on that as we go on. But Hebrew is of course the original language of the Old Testament, of the Bible, and by the Hebrews, it's called the Torah. <clears throat> now, in the Greek, there are three words which mean hell, or are translated into hell from the Greek language. They are Gehenna, Hades, and Tartarus. And we will take them one by one. Now, Gehenna, in the Strong's Concordance, is number G1067, Gehenna, of Hebrew origin 1516, H1516, the Hebrew, and of Hebrew H2011. The definition is the valley of the son of Hinnom, Gehenna or Gehenum, a valley in Jerusalem used figurati figuratively, a name of a place or state of eternal punishment, hell. Now before you get all shook up over words like eternal punishment, you have to realize that these are translated words and you have to realize the semantic field of the world of the words eternal punishment as by the standards of ancient Hebrew and the references in the Greek meaning the words eternal punishment as utilized here mean that the punishment of death which is to say the second death or the death of the soul will not be reversed it is permanent and it does uh, in no way imply that these souls are in a perpetual state of agony which will not end. But because the English language is not a fixed language like Hebrew or Greek but is rather a language of evolution which changes from age to age, words like eternal punishment conjure up visions or mental pictures in our minds because of how English uses these words. Most think it means everlasting pain or that it means their punishment is uh, beyond that that can be borne. 
but actually it just means their punishment is final. Now let's understand the first Greek word, Gehenna. Gehenna, as defined, is a valley south of Jerusalem called Hinnom. This was a place where gar the garbage of Jerusalem was disposed of, and there in the valley of Hinnom they burned the trash of Jerusalem. Now in those days they did not have big dump trucks or bulldozers or trash removal as we have now, but they did have a big trash dump and of course it was burned and smoltered night and day. And as there were many people in Jerusalem, thusly there was a lot of waste and rubbish or trash. Now the next word for hell is Hades, which is number G86 in the Greek partition of the Strong's Concordance from G1 as a negative particle and G1492 properly unseen, i.e. Hades or a place, state or estate of departed souls. And it is most often translated into the word grave or hell. That should give you a clue right there grave. Now the final word for hell is Tartarus, which is number G5020 in the Strong's Concordance. Tartaru from Tartarus, the deepest abyss of hell or Hades, to incarcerate in eternal torment, cast down to hell. Now remember what I said about translation when listening to that word Tartarus, and don't take the eternal torment to mean exactly what comes to mind when you hear it. Because you could easily get the wrong idea from the superstitious things which have been taught for many years in the churches. The words simply mean that their torment, their punishment of the second death is irreversible and final, that they are finished, that they become lifeless and shall never be again. And as we go into our Father's Word and use actual scripture, we will see this explained a lot better. Because we will hear the words not only of God, but of Jesus Christ and John the Baptist and Paul concerning what hell actually is. <clears throat> so now that we have our four words used in the Bible from the original languages, let's go and read from our Father's Word and see what God and Jesus and John and Paul said concerning what hell actually is so that we can g gain a clearer understanding. Now first we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament in chapter 28. And this will be God speaking. And this is another thing. You have to, when you read the Bible, you have to understand the subject and the object and who is being addressed and who is doing the talking and what the, what the subject being discussed is. Now in this chapter, chapter 28 of Ezekiel, God is addressing Lucifer, Satan, and in verse 18, God is giving him his sentence. So verse 18 reads, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, and by the, the iniquity of thy traffic. Now traffic utilized here means y your speech or your actions. In other words, Satan's speech and actions against God. To continue with the verse, God speaking, Therefore I will bring a fire bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Verse 19. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Okay, that seems pretty clear cut. God's own words concerning Satan's end or destruction. And yes, I said destruction. That didn't say Satan would live or suffer in hell forever, nor rule over hell. And it said he would be a terror, and not, and he would not be anymore. And the terror will be his destruction, and he will never be again after that. No, God said he will be destroyed. And if Satan, being the most evil of all, shall die or be destroyed, then surely his punishment is as great and severe as punishment gets. So too all the souls that are punished with him. No one is going to live in hell burning in un unbearable agony. And that's going to be made clear as we proceed through this study. Now Satan is to be destroyed, and this is why in the New Testament, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul refers to Satan as the son of perdition. 
We know it is Satan because the son of perdition from the Greek means the son who is to perish. And since God just gave him the death sentence in Ezekiel 28, then we know that this is Satan who is being discussed. Satan is the only son, creation, or uh, child of God, which has thus far been judged to death, other than the 7,000 who die in the streets of Jerusalem, who are the uh, fallen angels of Satan who he brings with him when he comes as Antichrist. So now let's go and see what John the Baptist, then Jesus himself, had to say about hell. Now John the Baptist spoke of hell in Matthew chapter 3. So let's go there and we will read his words. Matthew chapter 3, and we will begin in verse 10. And this will be John the Baptist speaking. And now also, as the axe is laid to the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth, forth, which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now what did it say is going to happen to them? They're hewn down and cast into the fire. Now I want you to note in this instance that, uh, as with many others, John is speaking spiritually and giving an example of men as trees. And even in the time of John and Jesus, as it is now, Trees, when cut down, if they are not used for uh, to build or lumber or whatever, are burned as trash. And all that remains once they are burned is ashes. Jesus reiterated John saying, in this same book of Matthew, in chapter 7 and verse 15, when Jesus himself said, verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come unto you in sheep's clothing. In other words, this is, Beware of false teachers who come to you looking like Christians. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves, which means they are out for themselves. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Verse 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Verse 19. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, which means burned up. Verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You might think of the parable of the tares and the wheat too. What happens to the tares when they are gathered up? Jesus again spoke of hell, or the second death, in Matthew chapter 10. So now we will turn over there and go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. This is probably one of the best explanations. Jesus speaking, verse 28 of Matthew chapter uh, 10. Fear not them which can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to kill both body and soul in hell. Now, of course, Christ is referring to God there. Fear him which is able to kill both body and soul. But now the word kill here used in this verse in the Greek language in the Strong's Concordance is number G615, apoktino, which means <coughs> to utterly destroy to kill outright, to put to death. So let's read that again with the proper understanding. Fear not them which can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to kill, utterly destroy, put to death both body and soul in hell. Now, those are Jesus' own words. And it means just what it sounds like it says. The final death. Which is to say, the death of the soul. Let us not forget the most quoted verse in the entire Bible. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to think about that statement by Jesus. What did he say? Should not perish. What does it mean to perish? Go look the word up in the Greek. I'm not going to look every word up for you. It means to die. To be done away with. An everlasting life. 
What is the opposite of everlasting life? Well, that would be life that is not everlasting, of course. That means it comes to an end. Now, in the book of Revelation, which is also Christ's words, as penned by John of Patmos, also known as John the Revelator, hell is again spoken of by Christ in several places. We will go to a couple of places during the rest of this study. But right now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. And again, these are Christ's words. Well, uh, some of them are Christ's words, some are John's vision. So chapter 13, I mean, uh, chapter 20, verse 13 of the book of Revelation. And it reads, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the book of life versus not being alive. Do you understand what the book of life means? Those who get to live. And let's ponder the next question. How can death and hell be cast into the lake of fire? It simply means that hell shall be destroyed. And death. Now, we will cover that farther or better as we go along here. But hell begins to look a lot differently when read and understood from the Bible rather than taught as a doctrinal or traditional perception. In this modern age, people, whether faithful or not, have ideas of what they think hell is. And it's pretty much the same. A place that is seven times hotter than the hottest fire where people scream in agony day and night forever and ever. But again... The torment, day and night, forever and ever, is a bad translation. The word torment there is not the torment word that we know in English. It doesn't carry the same weight. It's akin to it, but it doesn't carry the same weight. It simply means uh, one of two things in whichever verse it's involved with. In one case, the torment will mean they're tormented while awaiting judgment. In the other case, it means their death, their torment, is final and forever and ever. Their soul is dead forever and ever. And the majority of people do not realize just how much hell and its mystical perception came about long after the Bible's writings were complete. They don't understand how much influence man has had on the definition and perception of hell. They don't fathom how much writings like Dante's Inferno affected the definition and perception of hell. Some people even think that God is a vengeful, spiteful, mean God that tosses people into hell to suffer in insane agony for millions and millions and millions of years throughout eternity mercilessly. And this is in large part thanks to Dante's vision of hell and not from the Bible. In Dante's version of hell, hell had many levels, and the pain and torture suffered was governed by the types of sins of the individual or the amount of sins done by the individual. And Dante's vision of hell has had the most influence overall over what people think of as hell to this very day. However, Dante's hell is far from what the truth from the Bible is concerning hell. And when we think of our Father, we should realize that our Father came in the personage of Jesus Christ and suffered tempting from Satan, ridicule, scourging, and crucifixion by those who would not accept him and would not hear the truth to give us a way to salvation. Does that uh, sound like a mean, spiteful father? As Jesus spoke when he gave the parable of the good shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one ran off and was lost, the shepherd secured the ninety-nine who stayed and went in search of the one that was lost until he recovered it. And this is how our father feels. This is the kind of father we have. Now let's also look at heaven and hell here in a common sense way. How can we who make salvation, who find true peace and happiness with God, be happy in our eternal life if we are enjoying all the pleasures of heaven, while those who didn't make salvation, some of them our loved ones, are burning in eternal agony? 
this cannot be so. We couldn't be happy knowing that or being witness to the fact that uh, those we love or family members or friends are over there burning in the lake of fire. This is why the real definition of hell is that the souls that enter the lake of fire are burned up or blotted out. In other words, their souls die and are turned to ashes. You can think of it by John's example. There are many trees in this world, many different types of trees. But if a tree is cut down and burned in fire, it is gone, it is destroyed, it is turned to ashes. And while there are many other trees like it, no other tree is that exact tree. And once a tree is burned, it can never be remade, it is lost for good. And the same is true of our souls. Once a soul is destroyed in hell, it can never be remade, not even by God. It is in effect lost forever. Hell is the second death, the final death, the death of the soul, the blotting out. And yes, I will know that. Uh, I know that there will be those who say, "Well, what about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, who were separated by a gulf?" Again, you have to understand that this was not a literal. It, it was kind of kind of a literal, but rather it was an example. And Jesus was speaking spiritually. When the rich man was in hell begging for a drop of water on his tongue, it was not that he was thirsty from being in hell's fire. In other words, it's not that he was dehydrated, as we think of when we get out and work in the summer sun or whatever. It was that he was thirsty for a drink of the living water, which is to say the truth, God's word. Just as Jesus told the woman at the well, Drink of this water, and ye shall never thirst again. It always blows my mind when I hear TV preachers and those who use hellfire and brimstone to frighten people into church with threats of hell's flames. Now, they can state the fact and teach it without trying to scare people into church. They make our God out to be hot, heartless and uncaring and mean-spirited. We are made in the image of God, and we have certain compassions which are patterns of God's feelings. We will stop and help someone in need. Most, I'll tell you an even better example. Most of us, if we see an animal on the side of the road who has been hurt and is suffering, has been hit by a car or whatever, most of us will stop and end that animal suffering with a merciful euthanasia killing because we don't want the animal to suffer. This is why sometimes in life we have to shed tears when we put a family pet and loyal friend to sleep. Because we don't want the animal to suffer, we love them, and it hurts us, but we do it out of compassion. Now, if we as human beings in our imperfect nature, in our imperfection, will do this, do you think we have more love and compassion than our Father? Of course not. Anyone who goes to hell will deserve to be there. Now, there is unjustness with man's injustice and man's judgment, but this is not so with God. God's judgment and justice is true. There is no iniquity in it. And God only destroys those who would cause trouble and rebellion and disorder in the eternity. In short, they would ruin the eternity for the rest of us. And God won't allow that. He will make heaven a paradise where there shall be no more tears, no more pain, and no more death after hell. And he will do this for his children who are loyal and who love him. He is our father. The problem with hell's perception, as taught by most churches today, is those who call themselves learned in God's word, but who are not, use fire and brimstone to scare and convert people. And most often they're converting people into churches which don't know the truth anyway. In the Old Testament, this practice was known as Molech. In other words, in those times, idol-worshipping men who claimed themselves to be religious burned people alive as a method of pleasing or appeasing their gods. They even burned their own kinfolk or children to gain what they saw as favor from their gods or their salvation. And just as that, those who use hellfire and brimstone and damnation today think that they are doing God a service by scaring people into the church. But most often they are scaring people into churches which are ignorant of the truth anyway. And as far as Molech, 
the practice of it. God said in the book of Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 36, I did not bring that about, neither came it into my mind. And Moloch is an example of how fire and pain and punishment becomes the focal point rather than the true worship of God from the heart. In other words, people are threatened into loving God instead of real love generating from the individual as it is meant to be. And God doesn't want people scared to Him. And I know there will be some that says, well, what about where it says, fear ye the Lord? Well, go check it out. The word translated as fear is actually revere, or to show reverence unto your Father. We have a loving Father who will do what it takes to preserve His family. And if that means a few of His children, bad apples, won't come to right and have to perish, then that is the way it has to be. So be it. Those who perish are also God's children. And He's going to have to make a sacrifice to lose them. But they will not be corrected. They will not change. They don't care. Do you understand the love shown there by our Father to get rid of the bad who won't conform, who won't obey, who won't stop, stop causing trouble? They won't do anything but serve themselves. They will rebel and they care not who they hurt while doing so. You see that manifest in the uh, flesh age now. So what does it take to be able to get rid of the bad of your children so that those who are good and loyal and loving and righteous may live in peace for all eternity? It takes love. The love of a father who loves his family. Again, there are four words in the Bible translated that mean hell, and none of them even imply eternal agony, pain, or suffering. Those are man's concepts, definitions, and superstitions, and they are false teachings done in ignorance due to mythical religious doctrines and bad translation. Now, I don't ask anyone to accept my words for this, nor should you. You shouldn't take any man's word over things which are taught from the Bible unless you go and check him out for yourself. If you really want to know and be sure, then go look for yourself. Do your own study. Study to show yourself approved. You will most likely be stunned about what hell actually is rather than what you were taught. You may even learn a great many things that you were told or taught have misled you you might find that many of them are not even biblical. Now most of us have known that there was more to God's word than we've been taught. And we don't serve a hateful, spiteful God who enjoys watching suffering. We serve a loving Father who loves us, but a Father who practices discipline. And during the millennium and the thousand years teaching by Christ, His apostles and His elect, this is what's going to be taught, discipline. This is one reason why it is written, the dead live not again until the thousand years were complete. Well, what does that phrase mean? It means some of the souls, at least for now, are in jeopardy of being destroyed if they don't change their ways. They are referred to as mortal souls. God is fair and has made a way to salvation for us through Christ. But those who didn't have the chance to find Christ will have the opportunity during the millennium, that thousand years spoken of. And I know there will be those who hear that and uh, because they have been taught certain things in the churches, they either won't even know of the millennium, nor much less uh, what it's for. However, God is long-suffering and wants all of His children with Him forever. And God is judge. And He will go to any extreme as a loving Father to save as many of His children as He can before the great white throne judgment where all shall be judged. Now some will probably say, well, that sounds like a second chance. No, not really. Some never had a chance in this earth age with all the misleading teaching that goes on and has gone on through history. And uh, some will say, yes, but there's a church on every corner in every town. True enough. But with so many conflictions, so many choices in what people believe and choose to believe, some choose not to make the choice, especially in today's world where secularism and science have become the mainstream ideals for many and are being brainwashed into our children. But back to understanding hell. Actually, there will always be those who cannot see past equating punishment to pain and suffering. They cannot accept that God is compassionate 
and that he would rather destroy those who go to hell than abandon them in an out of sight, out of mind place of endless horrible agony. As a matter of fact, I know someone who is so stuck on that idea, she told me that, well, how can it be punishment if you're not suffering in pain? So I asked her, well, if you were to row out to sea in a boat and the boat turned over and you began to drown, would you try to stay alive? Would you fight for every breath? And she said, yes. I said, well, do you think your soul is any different than your flesh body? Do you think your life is uh, less valuable to your soul than it is to your flesh? But even so, uh, she and many who have been misled since birth, the concept of hell as an eternal burning agony is burned into their psyches, and they can't accept it any other way. So let them dream on. However, if you want to know the truth, open your eyes and ears, study God's word in depth, trace back to the original languages. Now you can listen to all teachers, all pastors, all priests, but check them out in God's word before you decide. Now before closing, we're going to go to a couple of more places, right quick. And we're going to look at everyday examples for us, first of all. An everyday example of the flesh. Now we know that this flesh is perishable, it gets old and rots and eventually dies. So as we live this life, we gain understanding through example. Because death of the flesh is something which will affect and strike all of us. And when we lose a friend or loved one, we feel the pain, the suffering, because of their absence. But we know through Jesus we can all be renewed with eternal life. Whereas the loss of a soul is eternal and is permanent. So this can give us better understanding of what it's like to lose someone after experiencing loss in these flesh bodies. It is an example to us of what it will be like to lose those who go to hell. Only they won't be coming back. They won't be resurrected. And while we're on this subject, we're going to talk about another misconception, or should I say misteaching, urban myth of Christianity. <coughs> I speak of the belief that when we die, we automatically go to either hell or heaven right then. In other words, some people think that upon our deaths, that uh, we are judged right then. And they think that some of their relatives or criminals or evil people are in hell right now burning like a piece of bacon. This is a common belief amongst some Christians, but it is a misconception. It is not what is actually written in our Father's Word. And some will say, well, are you teaching soul sleep? No, not at all. Our souls do not sleep except in the uh, definition given by Paul, which means to die, to pass on. But our souls don't die, only our flesh goes to sleep. In other words, passes away. No, this uh, heaven or hell right now is yet another misconception in traditional teaching. When we die, we go to be uh, to await judgment on one side of the gulf or the other. For as Christ said to one of the malefactors who was hung beside him when he was crucified, today you shall be with me in paradise. When we die, we go immediately back to our Father, as written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. But we go there to await judgment. We don't go there to be judged right then. Our Father's Word states that all are judged at the Great White Throne Judgment and not until then. And the Great White Throne Judgment comes immediately after the millennium and Satan's release for a short period. Until then, the unsaved souls, which in our Father's Word are referred to as mortal souls, are in the hell which is defined by the word Hades, which means a holding place. Again, Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus could see God and Christ and all the souls which have overcome, but they are across a great vast gulf from them. They cannot go and touch them. That is the definition of that word. It simply means the holding place. It doesn't, it, it doesn't mean uh, that they're cast right then into hell. Now, to prove that none are judged until the great white throne, uh, white, great white throne judgment, we will go to our Father's Word once again and read of this judgment day. So let's go to chapter 20 of the great book of Revelation again and see what is actually written. 
the book of Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 is where uh, the devil and then what you're deceived are being cast into hell. And this will be the real hell. So, chapter 20 and verse 10 of the book of Revelation, it reads, And the devil which deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented night and day forever and ever. Again, remember what I said about that word tormented. This is a translation taken from Greek and how Greek was spoken. And their sayings do not match up to ours. This simply means that their um, judgment, their death of their soul is final and forever and ever. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. From whose face the earth and heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And this is talking about the second earth age. And the second heaven age. Chapter 12. And I saw the dead, both great, both small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? So there you go. That's clear cut. The book of life, meaning you get to live, and if you don't, you get cast into the fire, which you burn up. People tend to think of immortal soul not being able to die. But immortal, what does mortal mean and immortal? Mortal means liable to die. And because they transcribe the word immortal soul to those which live, they also think it applies to those which are cast into hell. And that is not the case. Now, the way that is written, <coughs> let, let's cover another thing. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. The way that is written sounds confusing when read in English only, because how can death and hell be cast into the lake of fire? Well, first of all, Satan is death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And also, at death, he will be no more. And... Uh, Death, in other words, that is to say, death will be no more because after hell there will be no more death. No soul will ever die again after that point. And hell being cast into the lake of fire just means hell itself is burned up and finished. Even today when we have a raging fire and it runs out of fuel, it burns itself out because there's nothing left to burn. And hell is the end. Hell is not eternal except for the fact that once a soul dies is cast into the fire, it burns up and is destroyed eternally. It will never be restored, ever. It will never resurrect. Now to prove that hell is the end, and no souls endure eternal agony, we're going to go on to uh, Revelation chapter 21. And this takes place immediately following the judgment, when all those that are shall be cast into hell are cast into hell. Or, in other words, when all those who are going to hell have been cast into hell, or are cast into hell. Verse 1 of chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Remember it said the, old, the uh, heavens and earth passed away, or fled away from the face of God? I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Verse 2. And I John, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. Verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold the tabernacle of God with men. And he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself shall be there and with them and be their God. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, 
no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now he said there shall be no more death, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. How can there be pain if there is uh, no hell? When hell itself has passed away, there was no more pain. The former things are passed away. In other words, hell is burned up and there is no more pain, no more death of the souls after that point. At this point, evil is gone and blotted out and destroyed. Now, these are the truths from our Father's Word. Some won't hear it, some will. But don't be one of those wine containers, those wine skins, that is so stretched from years of having old wine in you that you cannot receive new wine because it will cause you to pop. If you don't understand that analogy, what I mean, then read the parable given by Christ when he said, new wine is not put under old containers. You see, in those times, wine was not stored in little green bottles like today. No, instead, wine was stored in the skins of animals. When an animal was slaughtered for food, they would peel the skin off and tie off all the orifices, orifices and uh, limbs of the animal so that the animal's skin became a watertight bottle. And then new wine could be stored in these skins. Only when new wine was poured into it, as the wine fermented, it caused the bottle to swell. When the wine was poured out of the wine skin, it was had completed its cycle and had fermented. But as it had done so, fermented, it had caused the bottle to swell and stretch out. In other words, now the wine skin, all the elasticity is gone. So that if new wine was poured into an old wine bottle, when the new wine began to ferment, it would cause the bottle to burst. Think of the old wine as what you have been taught. And think of new wine as the new truth you might receive if you study your Father's Word and open your ears to the truth. However, some cannot accept the truth because they have been brainwashed with false doctrines, with traditions and religious urban myths. And if you try to give them any new truth, new wine, they will burst and they won't accept it. And this is what Christ's analogy means. Remember, He is the fruit of the vine, and so is His truth. Now, I hope this study has helped you to better understand hell. I hope when you go in and study, you will see that we don't have a father who's going to put souls in a place where they're going to suffer like that for millions and millions and millions and millions of years because they didn't get things right in the short lifespan that we live in the flesh. But there will always be those who are moved by fear to believe anything new because of what they've been taught and because of the power that a church holds over them. And they won't hear the truth. The same thing happened when our Lord and Savior came in the personage of Jesus Christ. The church of that time wouldn't accept him. They rejected him. They turned him away. They called him a heretic. And they eventually caused his death. The same is true today. You can talk to your blue in the face trying to convince somebody of the truth and they will argue till they're blue in the face even if they don't know what they're talking about. Even if they haven't done any research, even if they haven't gone into the Hebrew, the Greek, or the Chaldee, even if they haven't done anything but read the Bible in sheer old good old English or sat in church for an hour or two a week and been brainwashed with whatever comes from the pulpit. It is my prayer for you that you won't be deceived and that this won't be the case with you. May God give you of his truth. May you drink of the w true wine. And may God bless you with thirst for his truth. But once you enter his truth, may he quench it and you never thirst again, just as promised by our Lord and Savior. Thank you for listening. May God bless you. This has been Just Thoughts.